not gonna lie to you guys, for the majority of my life, I was not the most athletically inclined person. And suffering from dyslexia, I spent the majority of my time in school struggling. But somehow, in spite of all this, I miraculously still had high self-esteem. I understood early on that there were just certain areas I was unable to compete in, so I had to learn to evaluate myself from a different angle. And uh, eventually, as most 12-year-olds do, I decided I was clever. Spoilers, I was not. I tried my hand at what I thought were clever people games. RTSs like StarCraft and Red Alert, and in single player I'd build these massive fortresses with multiple lines of defense and just build my forces to an arbitrarily large number before crushing the computer with a swift alpha strike. And then I got broadband internet and found out Koreans were a thing, and uh... Yeah, did you guys know that power overwhelming doesn't work online? Coming to terms with the fact that I was not a cunning savant was painful and I kind of subsequently lost interest in the whole strategy game genre. That was until I came across Valkyria Chronicles for the PlayStation 3. Fell in love with the gameplay and the art style right away, as did a healthy number of other fans. Which is why I was so confused when the game's sequel was a PSP exclusive. And its sequel was a Japanese exclusive PSP exclusive. What the hell, Sega? Do you want our money or what? Well, after a full 10 years, Sega's finally returning to the franchise in a way that doesn't make me think that they hate me personally. Our story begins on the continent of Europa, aka definitely not Europe. Europa is in the middle of the Second European War, whose participants include the Atlantic Federation and the East European Imperial. It's, it's World War II. Guys, it's anime World War II. And in case you were wondering, yes, it is the same anime World War II we fought and won in the first Valkyria Chronicles, only this time instead of playing as a brown-haired, milk-toast protagonist who's only in command because he brought his own tank, we play... Fuck! Meet our hero, Claude Wallace, the commander of E-Squad, who no doubt achieved that position thanks to his many notable armor-plated credentials. We follow Claude and the rest of E-Squad as they navigate their way through the Eastern Theater of Anime World War II on a special super-secret mission. Operation Northern Cross. Are they crossing into the north? Shut up, it's a secret! Ugh. The overarching story is about as simple as one might expect. Get from point A to point B, killing everyone you meet along the way with the ultimate end goal being to bring the war to a tidy conclusion. However, as anyone who is friends with the inspirational quote generator commonly known as that one girl who was really popular in high school knows, it's not about the destination, but the journey. The war and our part in it is largely just a vehicle for a wonderful character piece centering around your four plus main party members. Our leading man is the aforementioned Claude. Now, I was giving Claude a hard time just a moment ago, but I, I was joking. There really is a lot of depth to his character. An interesting element of this group dynamic is that our main party all knew each other before the war, which lets the cast flesh each other out through discussing various parts of their shared history together. A history that is not terribly kind to Claude. The poor guy was not always the heroic commander we were introduced to, and unpacking his past and current shortcomings, as well as watching him work to reconcile with his comrades, made Claude an infinitely more interesting protagonist than he looked on the surface. Next is Zadazu, who I was not a big fan of initially. He's introduced as this obnoxious, foul-mouthed yang to Claude's calm reserve yin, who's maybe a little handsier than he ought to be. While he does retain these traits throughout the majority of the game, over time we get to peel away at this caricature of masculinity Razu's fronting and get a look at someone much more compelling and human. Next is Riley, the blonde bombshell. Literally. Okay, so the entire cast isn't perfect. Riley does get some nice character moments, and while I generally like her and love her as a unit, I can regrettably describe her character in a single word. <laughs> Lastly is Kai, aka the one-shot killer, aka the one packing hams in her back pockets, aka best girl. Her character is one of the more interesting story-centric arcs in the game, so I'm certainly not going to risk spoiling anything, but she's as patient and decisive as you would imagine an elite sniper would be. The characters and how they relate to and interact with one another is mega compelling. 
The cohesive teamwork we see out on the battlefield is not always indicative of how the party personally feels about one another. Wait a minute. A tight-knit group of attractive youths constantly put in danger as they seemingly single-handedly dismantle a malevolent superpower? The only anime trope we have left to hit is that sweet waifu shit. World War II with waifus. I'm not sure if this is the best or the worst timeline. It's the breast timeline. We like to have fun here at Rainfall Review. Now, I wish the only thing I really had to worry about was making content for you guys, but as anyone who regularly takes Viagra will tell you, growth is important. So if you enjoy my content, I would appreciate it deeply if you go ahead and click the subscribe. Oh, wait, 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 stop. Before you click offer me soliciting subs mid-video, just what if I told you I'm giving away a copy of Valkyria Chronicles 4? Yeah? Yeah, you like that? Yeah, okay, all right. So if you want to enter, go ahead and click the giveaway link down in the description to find out all the ways that you can enter. And uh, we're going to go ahead and run the contest until this day right here. So you probably still have a chance to enter. Unless, of course, you're watching from the distant future, in which case you could probably pick it up on a Steam sale for like $7.99. So, congratulations. Oh, also check out my page. At its core, Valkyria Chronicles 4 is a turn-based strategy RPG that plays 40% like a top-down RPS and 60% like a third-person shooter. The actual gameplay is divided into missions, each mission having its own surprisingly varied objectives and the occasional special failure conditions such as uh, don't let person X totally fucking eat it. At the beginning of each of your turns, you're given some number of command points, or CP. The main way you'll be using CP is by moving and positioning your units, but there are some other quite impactful ways to spend it that we'll get into later. Units are assigned a certain amount of action points, or AP, according to their class, which governs how far they can move after being selected. And here's where the strategy elements begin to peek out. While looking at the map, time is frozen and nobody is shooting anybody. All the murder takes place after you select a unit and begin moving them around the map and immediately ends when you finalize their position, even if they're, say, two feet in front of an enemy shock trooper. This cordial, dare I say, gentlemanly approach to war gives you time to methodically plan your turns and gradually develop your strategy. Although, if you ask me, you should adopt the winning strategy of the past two world wars, that being unload a machine gun into their face. The classes are as follows. Scouts are your highly mobile recon units. Equipped with marksman rifles and grenades, they're effective at getting the drop on the enemy and giving them the old, uh, five tap to the dome, as well as uncovering enemy locations for other units to see. Shock troopers are basically anime Rambo. Ambo, if you will. We won't. Okay. Sporting close range machine guns as well as grenades, they tend to be sent on repeated suicide missions, racking up body counts worthy of a 911 call to the Chicago PD, and somehow always make it out within an inch of their life. Lancers are your anti tank units, but are also known to, on occasion, straight up vaporize the odd, decidedly not armor plated infantry unit. They are absolutely essential in a handful of missions, but other than that, thanks to how slow and inaccurate they are, the tank does the same job, but better. Snipers, who are totally fair and balanced when you're using them, but complete bullshit on the enemy team. Snipers carry only three shots at a time and only recover one shot a turn. But in spite of this, they are still one of the most useful units in your arsenal, able to one-shot enemy infantry at impressive distances, clearing the way for your scouts and shock troopers. Engineers are likely the most versatile class in the game. They have high AP, comparable to scouts, and hold up to three grenades at a time, letting them flush out tough-to-kill enemies like shock troopers. This coupled with the fact they can perform free actions. So many free actions, things like reviving downed allies, dismantling mines, refilling ally ammo, repairing broken barriers, and then still being able to play into our key strategy of shoot them in the face or repair a tank. Engineers, don't leave home without one. And lastly is the class new to VC4, the Grenadier, a mortar-wielding class with a massive range that opens up interesting new lines of interaction. 
What makes the Grenadier such an awesome addition to the game is that if an allied unit uncovers an enemy unit, the Grenadier can fire on them without having a direct line of sight themselves. They can just straight up nuke a guy on the other side of a building or a hill or a bush or whatever. And on top of that, they work defensively as well, letting them continually bombard the enemy as they move about on their turn. Without a doubt, this mixes up the gameplay from the previous installments and adds a huge amount of fun. And finally, we get to our tank. Now, I know what you're thinking. Wow, having control of an armor-plated death fortress seems strong. Yes, having control of an armor-plated death fortress was indeed strong. Your primary tank throughout the game, the Huffin, exceeds at blowing up other tanks, flushing out hard-to-reach infantry with mortars, and of course, employs the time-honored path to victory of shooting him in the face. In addition to all of this, aside from its obvious blue glowing weak spot, the tank is pretty much indestructible and thus can act as a kind of mobile shield for your other units in a pinch. The only thing that really stops you from soloing the game with your tank is the fact that there's just so much shit in the way. God damn, it gets caught on everything. As for the units themselves, there are an impressive amount to choose from. Of course, you have your core members, central to the plot, all of whom you're incentivized to use each and every mission, as including them in your party rewards you with bonus CP at the beginning of each of your turns. But aside from them, you have your nameless, faceless infantry who, in a shocking twist, actually have names and faces. All of these units have specific people they like to work with, as well as various positive and negative status effects that proc when certain conditions are met, known as potentials. How cruel is it that VC4 gives each of these units small character quirks and enough visual distinction and personality to make you care about them, and then also has permadeath? Well, my adorable tipsy shock trooper just died. Again, time to restart the mission. Probably has nothing to do with the fact that she's always fucking shit-faced. Oh, uh, oh, it indeed had everything to do with the fact that she was always fucking shit-faced. Now, if you restart a mission every time a character gets downed, you would add another 30 hours to this already beefy game. Enter the new Brave mechanic. When a character is downed, you'll sometimes be given the option to either entrust or stand up. Entrusting consumes 1 CP and gives a status boost to your allies so that they can come bail your worthless ass out. And stand up fully restores your AP, makes you invulnerable to all damage, but you drop dead where you finalize your position. This is an interesting system that makes getting a lone unit ambushed and killed feel just a little less crappy. Orders add another dimension to the way you see the battlefield. Essentially, what orders boil down to are buffs that can be placed on your units at the cost of CP. The more impactful the order, the more CP you have to shell out. Enemy commanders also have access to orders, which can create some surprising, uh, oh shit situations, but they don't really possess the capacity to straight up break the game like you can. Now I'll ask you, who would win? The full military force of the world's wealthiest nation? Or one angry minority whose commanding officer just yelled at him a bunch? Rather than leveling up units individually, you instead increase the level of each class as a whole, gradually improving their respective stats, as well as occasionally providing you with new potentials and orders. Speaking of beefed up gear, you will spend a significant amount of time in your research center gradually improving all your weapons, armor, and of course, your tanks. This, my friends, is your sweet ass boat, the Centurion, and it brings with it a set of very useful combat tricks in the form of ship orders. These orders include fan favorites such as the ability to call in artillery strikes and a radar that reveals enemies within a certain radius, as well as a host of other immensely useful abilities all of which can be used at the cost of CP. So I'm not gonna beat around the bush. This game gets fucking hard. Anything past the first handful of missions, you're likely not gonna pass on the first try, and even if you do, it's probably gonna be with a less than stellar mission rating. There are ambushes and bosses that enter halfway through a mission that you have no way of anticipating or planning around the first time through. That being said, I was never once deterred from retrying a mission, even after a BS crushing defeat. Once you've failed once or twice, that's where you really get to prove yourself as a tactician. Knowing when and where that ambush is going to take place, where the boss will enter from, and playing around it results in some of the most satisfying single-player gameplay I've had the fortune to enjoy in a while. Oh, and on a side note, fuck the bosses, 
Tanks that can gun down your units while they're positioning themselves on their turn. Valkyries that can curve projectiles like Angelina Jolie curves bullets. And these two little shits in particular can run across the map, one hit kill everything, and have eyes in the back of their goddamn skulls. Look at this shit! How are these lollies dodging sniper fire from a direction they're not even looking? This is fucking bullshit! It was, in fact, fucking bullshit. The only real complaint I have about Valkyria Chronicle 4's gameplay is that this real-time strategy game contains within it one of the cardinal game design sins. A stealth mission? A motherfucking stealth mission! This pus-filled genital ward of a level on this otherwise pristine game took me more than eight attempts to complete before finally overcoming its vague lines of sight and janky improvised stealth mechanics. But at least all my, my hard work built towards a wonderful story moment for my best girl, right? No? We find out that our intervention was unnecessary and said stealth mission was a complete unnecessary waste of my life and we're all just supposed to laugh about it? <laughs> Look at me! I'm laughing! I'm so happy! These are tears of joy! Now shut up, you're crying! <laughs> BC4's visuals return to its gorgeous, watercolor, almost sketchbook-like aesthetic. The muted shades of our squad's olive and beige uniforms are contrasted by the vibrant environments in which we find ourselves waging war. In addition, the art direction on display here really nails the pseudo-steampunk World War II vibe. Everything from the tanks to the uniforms to the architecture all have a very strong 1930s European aesthetic to them, but with enough liberties taken to clearly separate the game's inspiring events from the romantic version of war we've come to enjoy. The environments are wonderfully varied, providing a wealth of interesting locations to leave a trail of bodies. Everything from war-torn farmlands and icy tundras to European-esque cities and stormy mountain passes. One of the relics from the previous installments I wish had been done away with is the window-based character conversations. In like 90% of the dialogue scenes, the characters address one another from these little frames. It's certainly not the worst thing, but I just get the feeling that this is less of a style decision and more of a shortcut so they didn't have to fully animate scenes for the approximate billion hours of character conversations. The sound design is nailed perfectly. The guns, while far from realistic sounding, ring out in a satisfying way. The marksman rifles have a visceral pop to them, the snipers let loose an intimidating crack, and the crisp, unmistakable ring of a headshot triggers the release of more dopamine than munching on cocaine-dusted edibles while fast-passing your way to the front of a line in Disneyland. The game's voice acting is, uh, is fine? I guess? I mean, it's, it's good. I mean, I enjoyed their performances, despite some of the delivery being, uh, Kinda anime? <laughs> the only real issue I take with the voice work is that there is just so damn much of it. Most of the main story is fine, but there are large numbers of pointless ramblings from side characters and numerous tangents that add nothing to the plot, and at times, two plus hours between actual gameplay. For reals, we are talking cutscene to gameplay ratios that would tighten the slacks of even Hideo Kojima. The score is lovely, to be sure, with its sweeping orchestral movements and intimate arrangements punctuating some of our party's more emotional moments together. But the only thing I want to talk about is the cheesy opening cinematic and its accompanying song. Jesus Christ, it sounds like a 1970s love ballad sung by Anne Murray. And I love it. Valkyria Chronicles 4 was a true pleasure to play through. A marginal, yet appreciable improvement over the original installment that I am more than happy to have sunk over 50 hours into. Whether you're into strategy games or not, I can wholeheartedly recommend you check this one out, because this game is gold. Thanks for checking out my review, guys. I hope you enjoyed it. If you made it this far, I, I'm guessing you did? Uh, and so you'll probably just want to be reminded of the awesome giveaway link down in the description. You can check it out. A whole bunch of different ways to enter, following me on various media platforms, blah, 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 blah. Uh, I want to thank Sean Van Pelt for supporting me as a high tier patron for over a year now. Sean, everyone give Sean a round of applause. This guy, this guy 
is a champion. He keeps my editing programs running smoothly. You're, you're champion, man. Thank you so much. And of course, thank you to all my other Patreon supporters. If you want to go ahead and support me on Patreon, you enjoy my content, link down in the description. Check it out. No obligation. Just considering it is more than I could even ask. But thank you for even if you're just watching and sharing. Thank you so much, guys. Uh, also, speaking of the community, we've got a Discord. Go ahead and check it out. Link down in the description. Got a great community of people over there. It's the first place I uh, let everyone know when I'm going live to stream, when I stream the games I'm reviewing. So if you're interested in catching those, again, check it out. And of course, links to all my other videos and stuff you got over here. We got a Dragon Quest XI and got a, got a witch game with lesbian witches. Fantastic. Uh, but yeah, so uh, thanks for sticking around, everyone. And in the meantime, I guess we're done here. <laughs>